Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In case I miss out, I better say Merry Christmas way ahead. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a joy to serve the Lord. And uh, when I was uh, preparing this particular uh, scriptures that was uh, given to me, I was uh, so elated because not only I prepared, I also uh, felt uh, <coughs> it speak to my heart, volumes of it, and therefore uh, it's going to be a great blessing. Uh, I'm sure this is not a, a strange uh, portion of scripture, and uh, some of you must have heard it many times over. <coughs> uh, I'd like to bring to our remembrance, the word of God is line upon line, precept upon precept. Though we may have heard it before, I want you to know it's like like the chiu yen kao, like kue lapis like that. One layer after another to, to fortify us, to bring us to the place that, that we can meet up with God, God meet up with us. Amen? Hallelujah. God is a good God. Praise the Lord. My thought this morning is on servanthood. Uh, not because I'm expert in servanthood, uh, but uh, it is very important, uh, servanthood that is taught by Jesus. I want to quickly read the, the passage of scriptures with all of us so that we have a backdrop of where we are coming. This is taken from John 13, all right? And uh, it's very illustrious. It's because Jesus knew at this point in time, he is returning back to the Father. And he left behind one of the most, most important, important instruction to the disciples, servanthood. And uh, let us see how he demonstrates this. Okay. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now that I am doing, but later you will understand. Next. So said Peter, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Verse 10. Jesus answered, <clears throat> those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes <clears throat> and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Verse 15. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. May the Lord bless the reading of this precious word. Now, up to this point, John, 
that we have seen Jesus doing work that no one else had ever done. It's so interesting, just so exciting. If you and I are used by God and lay hand on the sick and they recover and they are healed and you rejoice. And generally, generally believers, we are very excited about healing ministry, deliverance ministry, seeing signs and wonders. Why not? Every believer wants to participate in such a, a phenomenal expressions of God's love to touch mankind. Like Jesus turning water into wine, give sight to the blind, raise the dead. My next slide tells us, now Jesus does what almost anyone can do, but what few want to. What was that? Washing feet. We like to be attached to all the glamorous activity of the Christian church. But doing the mundane, the lowly, washes feet. The king of kings, Jesus, does the work of a slave. To what extent is Jesus' work an example for our own work? He washes the disciples' feet. Jesus explains literally tells them and by extension to us that we are to follow his example. That's why he said, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you <clears throat> an example. John chapter 13 verses 14 and 15. Before I continue, I must add this observation. <clears throat> all Jesus' work are holy. Typical Singaporean, <clears throat> when you volunteer and serve the work in the local church, sometimes the work becomes so horrendous, taxing you, stress you. Sometimes it exact you to the point, unconsciously as Singaporean, we let go a certain word which I commonly heard, S-H-I-T. I run to remind you, God's work is holy. No work that is so terrible is S-H-I-T. Tell yourself, God's work is holy. No matter how it exact on you, His work is holy. You know why? You go back to the Old Testament, when the Levites and the priests prepared the animals for sacrifice, and the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seats, and the organs and the blood, and the cleaning after the whole service, is very, very, very lots of works that nobody wants to do, but it's tasked to the priesthood. They clean it up. Deep in their heart and how they think, God watches. No word cross their heart and their mind. They don't even entertain the word S-H-I-T because these are holy work. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. No, whatever you are involved, and you rise above that, and you establish your stature. The way I serve my God, every ounce and every pain is holy unto the Lord. Amen? Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah. So when you take upon this responsibility, and you now, the Lord Jesus told the disciples, I have set you an example that you do as I have done for you. <laughs> you know, it is not so much a matter of action as the attitude. Jesus, who is spirit-filled teacher, who reigns over the entire cosmos that he created, deliberately performs a concrete act of lowly service to demonstrate what ought to be the habitual attitude of his people. When the disciples saw it, 
they identify themselves. They are called out as a group of believers to serve. Hallelujah. And that's how their master took on the towel, wrapped around his waist, kneeled down, and washed the feet of disciples. I remember the second trip by Smithen Revival Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve, that came down to Singapore and the Assembly of Singapore hosted this revival meeting. The Salvation Army Director in Singapore came to me. I was the chairman of the whole crusade. And he said, Pastor Anthony, can you do the Salvation Army a favor? I said, yes, how can I help you? The Salvation Army had all these years wronged the assemblies of God. We, to the word, cursed the assembly for doing what blah, 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 blah. In this revival, the Lord had touched the leadership of the Salvation Army Singapore. Pastor Anthony, can you do something? During the revival time, we want to wash the feet of your general superintendent, Reverend Dr. Patrick Lau, as a symbol of repentance and reconciliation. So I went to my general superintendent that this was request made by the Salvation Army Directorates. He said, wonderful, let it be done. And so we bring a basin. The two gentlemen represents the two denominations, wash one another's feet. I want you to know that is humility. Hallelujah. We may rise up to the ranks and files of denomination, but the act and attitude and the spirit was exemplifying. Hallelujah. In doing so, brings us tangibly face to face with the reality that godly work is performed you know, for the benefit of others, not just the fulfillment of ourselves. I ask myself this question next. Why Jesus? <laughs> Why Jesus wash the disciples' feet? To us, a typical Singaporean or city dwellers, you know, uh, what what is he trying to hint? What what is he trying to get to? You know, uh, you know, there are so many better things to do than just <laughs> wash people's feet. I just came back from Samoa a few hours ago. You know, it's, my body is still very uh, adjusting to the jet lag. You know, in Samoa they dress so well, but when you look at their shoe, they wear slipper. That is their national dress code. Some of them don't even <laughs> wear shoes. That's why their sh their, their the sole of their feet are totally out of shape, and no shoe shop can. <laughs> you cannot buy a shoe that fit them. They, they, their soul is so flattened out, you know. And their legs are so dirty. And so I wear my slipper like they wear their slipper. Every time when I come back from my classes teaching, when I wash my leg, wow, it carries dirt, man. But to them, it's their lifestyle. So in Israel, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he is bringing a cross to the disciples. You know, to wash the feet. I'm sure that 12 disciples sitting around the table, they are, you know, fiddling their fingers who is going to wash whose feet first. And Jesus, knowing their hearts, took upon himself, never mind their talk. Action is more important. Took the water and start washing the disciples' feet. It was a tremendous, a tremendous learning lesson for the disciples. Jesus, as the leader, got down and did a dirty job because he's showing love for them and service for them. Jesus never correct them, but Jesus demonstrate how you want to be a leader, you need to learn to be humble and come down to where people are and serve them. To serve each other, through the act of service, disciples saw that Jesus serving them. The little things we do when we serve Christ by living out 
who he was in our lives by little bitty acts of service. And when you go to heaven to receive your reward, this is what he said. Next slide, please. Thou good and faithful servant, that is our heavenly reward. It's not how much sacrifices that we laid down. You are faithful. You are faithful. You know, I served in the ministry since 1972. A couple of years ago, before the pandemic, my denomination, which I belong to, the Assemblies of God, they honor me. 40 years as an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God. 40 years. When I look back 40 years, a blink of an eye, <laughs> the youth of my life, all given to the Lord. And when I hear, when I heard, the mouth of the young ministers and the ministers in the congregation honoring me, Anthony Poin, they give me one word, faithful. You feel very comforted, the people acknowledge your devotion. Not that all these years, you just want to garner one word, faithful. I don't think that is the right attitude. But because they saw through the lives of a man, a woman in our denomination, laid down their life for 40 years straight as an ordained pastor, I want you to know it's fantastic. When we set ourselves to be faithful, the younger generation will rise up to be faithful because there is a model of faith to copy. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. And every time I tell my congregation, when I see a knitted family, all strong in their marriage and no divorce. Our young couples rise up. They have confidence in their marriage and how to overcome challenges in marriages. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. That is the same way. You know, cleaning the lakes is only household servants were expected to do. My first trip to Samoa I was introduced to the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Joe Amosa. Samoa is a big island, and you have to travel by ferry to a smaller island called Savai. That's where the Bible school uh, is located, and where the general superintendent, uh, his house was located. We stayed in his house for two nights, and then come back to the main island. And we were in his home, and we were eating the Samoan meal, makan. They don't cook rice. Their staple food is ubi, yam, or they call it taro. They give you one thick slice of taro, and you eat the ubi with whatever meat dishes. And me and my wife, how to, how to, how to reconcile ubi with chicken meat or with fish meat is new to us. What we were very uncomfortable was a lot of young men stand around our table. No girls, all young men. And every time when we finish something, the young men will quickly dish and replace what we finish. We keep telling them, uh, 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 excuse me, we are Singaporean, we do it ourselves. No need for you to serve us. And uh, Joe Amosa explained to, to me, uh, Pastor Anthony, uh, let them serve you. These are Bible school students. During mealtime, I bring them into my house to attend to guests that I bring into my family. Some of them are accountants. Some of them are lawyers. Some of them are great men in the society. They resign their job to become Bible school students and train themselves for the ministry. I want them to learn to serve, to teach them servanthood leadership. Allow them to serve you. When I realize the motives behind letting this gentlemen serve, I become a bit more, you know, understand their context. Would we do that <laughs> in our Singapore context? And uh, you come with a great background of, you know, talent, and if you are reduced to such a thing, 
will you do that? And yet this man carried themselves because they love Jesus and they are willing to serve. Hallelujah. Very, very beautiful attitude and spirit that exude, you know. And then the, only after when we finish eating, then they eat. <laughs> so interesting context. You know, in every other religion, the leader is served by their followers. Every other religion, followers serve, wait upon, make provision for, and give the possessions to the leader they serve. But not in Christianity. Jesus did not come to be served by others, but to serve them. Jesus does not lead by being served, but by serving. And this is very illustrious of the Christian church. And I want to thank God for the opportunity to share with you because Revival Center is a church that men and women will serve one another regardless of race, language, you know. And, 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 and we come together because we are sinners saved by grace. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us see how Acts, the book of Acts, speak to us. Next slide, please. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hand, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So this is our Lord. He made the world. And yet he comes down in lowliness to serve us. Let us look at what Mark says. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Luke says this. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who for the one who serves. Is it not the one who is at the table, but I'm among you as one who serves. So the Christian language is very straightforward. Serving. Serving. No need to be asked. No need to roll out the red carpet. Can you do this for? No need. The moment we see there's the need, we rise up and begin to serve. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. If there be a piece of tissue paper on the carpet, no need to find out who's the fellow who threw that. <laughs> Go and pick it up and, you know, throw it into the bin. No need to escalate who is responsible. I learned that lesson from Northbridge Road Hawker Center. One day I was queuing up to buy the dessert from this dessert store, and there was this commotion. An older ama cut into the queue line. And the fellow who was queuing almost to be served, the ama cut into the queue line and start ordering her food. That one who queued to be, get so agitated. But the lady was very skillful. She used this Mandarin word. Xiao shi, xiao shi, mei shi, mei shi, xiao shi. Small matter, small matter. It calms the man down. And I saw it, I said, wow. So I start learning the word. Mei si, mei si, no problem, no problem, no problem. It calms down. Even though you, you can be very ag agitated, it calms down. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we learn wisdom from someone who knows, you know, eat more salt than we eat more rice. Praise the Lord. God did not create the world so he would have you. He created the world so you could have him. And, and we can enjoy him. God didn't create the world so that you and I would meet his needs. He created the world so that he would glorify himself by meeting ours. By the way, God does not need you and I. He lacks nothing. There's nothing that it's not anything we can give him or do for him that he does not already have by virtue of the fact that he is God. We cannot serve him just as if he was needy, give to him as if he were lacking, supply him as if he were depleted, support him as if he were 
dependent on us, empower him as if he were weak, inform him as if he were ignorant, or heal him as if he were wounded. God does not need all these things. He is God. And we serve him because we love him. Hallelujah. That is your reason of serving. I'm sure you have kept track with the news. Many years ago, we had a very unfortunate incident in the Christian church in Singapore where fraud came about and one of our mega church was involved, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the horrible Singaporean journalists went around to interview, to collect and publish on the newspaper and let the public decide what they publish. If I know who is that joker, I'm going to come against him. And there was this. They go and publish the Archbishop of the Methodist Church, how much salary he has got. None of your business. But they dig it out and publish on the newspaper to let the general public look at his salary and say, wow, a man of charity collects so much money with all the perks. It's not necessary. It is not necessary. Why? All these years he laid down his life for the Lord. And perhaps this is the time the Lord reward him materially. Why be jealous? Rather be thankful that the church of the Methodists know how to honor this man and give it to him. Who are you to be jealous of? It's terrible. And then he came to another mega church and interviewed a member. And I thank that member because he speaks Singlish and was published in the Straits Times. I love that. I wish I can cut out there and paste it, you know. He told the journalists, because the church people give, they give. And then the journalists interview him. Why do you give so much of your hard-earned money? And he told that journalist, I want to love my Lord Jesus. Cannot lah. You want to teach me how to give? Ooh, that is real singlish. I want to love my Lord. Cannot lah. <laughs> People give because they love Jesus. And someone say, Amen. You know why? I just came back from somewhere, as I told you. One of the lady teachers came up to me. Pastor Anthony, uh, uh, you were talking about giving 10% tithe. I said, yes. You know, one of my Christian friends told me, uh, we don't, in the New Testament, you don't give tithes anymore. Hmm, all right. So your friend is practicing New Testament principles. said, yes. Can I tell you and help you understand? You know, New Testament principle is generosity. God gave his all, one and only son. Do you think your friend who tells you that no need follow 10%, just you know, practice New Testament. Do you think your friend is generous? Or he is excusing himself not to give? If you are practicing New Testament, I want you to know generosity. You give beyond 10%. Can you measure up to that? Thank God we follow certain guidelines, 10%, in such a terrible economy that we are walking through in Singapore, God never increased to 11%, still 10%. Even if our Singapore money decreased by inflation, he still asked for 10%. If you insist that you practice New Testament, oh, I tell you, I want to watch your generosity. If not, you are deceiving yourself. Am I correct? Where are your generosity? Oh, suddenly she realized generosity. Yes, the New Testament never teaches us 10%, but I learned from the New Testament, generosity. Hallelujah. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. I tell you, Revive Center will be very rich. Everybody practice generosity. Hallelujah. And your leadership here will smile from year to year. All our old tongues is met. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God. Let me quickly come to the next slide. What? Uh, number 16. What comes to mind when you think about serving another person? A human being. 
What comes to your mind? You know, uh, Paul gives us three very distinct uh, expressions of how he laid down his life for others. And that is found in Romans chapter 1. Give me the next slide, please. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Chapter 16, verse 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Paul tells us, I am at some point, I lay down my life because I love my Jesus. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we will thrive strong in the year 2024 when we find ourselves understanding what is servanthood. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Paul further demonstrates this to us. In 1 Corinthians, this is what he said. You were bought with at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so we belong to him. The little that we serve, we should not consider so much as sacrifice. I want to thank God for opportunity. Many years ago, I served under uh, our dear, lovely Pastor Obenki at Grace Assembly, Tangling Road. I was uh, assistant pastor in charge of the English language group. I learned how to serve that man of God. The first thing that came on me was my first Christmas at Grace Assembly. The members loved their pastor so much. And they drove the car to the office, which his home is next to the church office. And they came out on the back of their car, a big box, Christmas locket. And they came to the office. I happened to be in the office. Uh, Pan Musu, uh, Pastor Puang, where, where is the senior pastor? Oh, he, he went out for visitation with uh, Sister O. All right, can you give this lock cake to, to the pastor? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, oh, 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 you are new here, don't worry. I have also a, a little box of cake for you, two cupcakes. <laughs> One is a lock cake, me, two cupcakes. I didn't even bring home. I just eat, my wife don't know. And that was the first couple that brought this lock cake. Towards the late afternoon, another car came. Another box of lock cake. Where, where, where is Pastor? O? Oh, he hasn't come back yet. Can you hand this to him? Ah, we remember you. We, put, we, we bought two gingerbread for you. <laughs> you learned to be content. You don't be jealous. Pastor O has laid down his life all these years to build grace assembly. And God bless this man and he's receiving his reward. Let it be. I'm a young man, young in the ministry. Why should I be jealous of my pastor who God is blessing him? I grew up learning how to serve. No grudge, no murmur, no complaint. Why? My cake's so small. His cake's so big. How can the men and women of God eat so many lock cakes? That is not my pasa to question how many lock cakes he can eat. If he doesn't share with the staff, so be it. But it teaches you to serve. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. What is your motive of serving? You know, very dangerous. You are bought with a price. Honor God with your bodies. Praise the Lord. And as you love God and begin to love his people, this is what Jesus said to those who love him. Next slide is Matthew eleven thirteen. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so if you want to be a s my disciples, the first thing you need to learn is serving. And I want to repeat again in John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus did not say, eh? I wash your feet so you would in turn wash my feet. No. Does he say, I wash your feet so that you will love me enough to do things for me that I need to have done. Rather, he serves his disciples so that they will have an example and power to serve others. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. It is important, therefore, brothers and sisters, as God bless you and give you skills and talents enough in life, we rise up with the beautiful gift of God in our lives, devoting ourselves to one another. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says in verse 10, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. In other words, by all means, serve God, but always as one who receives, not as the one who gives. Serve as the recipient, not as the donor. You know, sometimes we serve we have this silent pride, ego. You see, when I serve a person who is in need, I make the recipient small. And the way I do it, I make myself big. But the scripture reverses it. Do not think that what you have, you give this or help make you big. It is God who gives you the mercies the ability, the empowerment to serve. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, I want to repeat this. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus gave that outstanding final message to the disciples in the close room encounter. I think this is good because Jesus honored the 12 disciples. Jesus gave them dignity. Jesus never did this in the public to shame the disciples. He did this in closed door context to watch the disciples privately. If he were to do this in the public place, the people will say, how come the teacher wash your feet? He reduced himself to a slave. No, Jesus reversed the teaching of the understanding of the society. In, next slide. Jesus says to his followers, I did not come to the earth so that you could serve me. I came so that I might serve you. So Jesus served, and he left that, that impression. And through the generations that we learn from the scriptures, servanthood, serving, servanthood, serving. I came so I might serve you. And someone say amen. Hallelujah. Jesus came. Jesus did not come to look for people to work for him or to wash his feet. He came to work for us. He came to serve us. Jesus did not come to recruit and to meet God's needs. <laughs> God has no needs. Jesus came to bring you the resources of God to meet your needs. He died to meet your needs. He rose from the dead to meet your needs. He reigns on high to meet your needs and to make you happy in Him forever. In fact, it's like a divine sarcasm. God slaps our arrogance in the face when he says in Psalms, let's look at Psalms. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and the fullness 
am I? Uh, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. This is our great and mighty God. Hallelujah. Uh, praise the Lord. Paul wrote this in Philippians. This is what he says in Philippians 2. To work out our salvation in fear and trembling because it is God who works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. We work out our salvation with trembling because we love God. Hallelujah. And we, and we desire to serve him. And uh, whatever the Lord plays on our hearts, we serve him wholeheartedly. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. Hallelujah. In closing, Paul wrote very intimately in the writings to the Romans believers. In Romans chapter 15, this is what he said, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished to me, to bring the Gentiles obedience by word and deed. Paul never take glory for himself. Whatever sacrifice that he will lay down, his whole aim is to bring the Gentiles to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has to go through all the suffering. But he's so willing. Hallelujah. A lot of things in my journey of uh, little ministry the Lord has given me in this lifetime, you know, so much, so much thing have to lay down for the cross of Calvary. I never tell anybody. It's a price I pay. I don't go around and gobble, you know, by serving God, I got to know. We serve him because we love him. Hallelujah. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, I want to remind you as I come to the close of today's sharing, the work of God is holy. Turn to your neighbor. Hey, holy. Never say, wah, piang wah, wah, I got to, don't do that. It is holy work. Am I correct? Don't grumble, don't complain, don't murmur. Wow, this elder are really arrow me. Oh, do it. please. The work of the Lord is holy. Take it. Father, I love you. I want to serve you. Thank you for the opportunity that I'm entrusted this task. I start with my first frame, servanthood. And my last frame is servanthood leadership. Until we learn servanthood, we cannot be leader. I close with this illustration. I served as the executive committee in the Assemblies of God denomination for 15 years, 8 years as a general secretary. And every year there will be candidates apply to be ordained and call themselves some license and then some exhorter. We don't have Christian worker. Nine of us will interview the candidate, candidate, particularly the ordination candidate. Individual. One person faces the nine of us. I don't know whether this is an interview or interrogation. Faces all of us. The general superintendent will shoot the first question and he asks, all right, Next, all of you start asking this man or this woman your question. As being the generous secretary, I will be the last because whatever at the end of the whole conversation and uh, we excuse the candidate and uh, we decide. And I am the one who signed on the application form. Reject or approve. Very powerful signature. If I don't sign, the eight of them cannot force me to sign, yes or no. And so I'm the last person 
to ask questions. And they know Anthony Point will always ask two questions. First question, you apply for to be ordained. Tell me one story in your life you have been broken. Number two, tell me one story in your life you have stability. Some of the candidates can't answer that. In serving one another, we need brokenness. Just like a wild horse with all the horsepower, if the horse is not broken and tame, the horse does not know how to bring that massive horsepower within the horse to help you ride a carriage. If we put two horses together and they are not broken and tame, the two horses will go a different direction and your whole carriage will be destroyed. But if you are broken, you will pull together your horsepower and pollinate your energy and you will ride long distance exponentially your strength. You need to be broken. And if you are in a committee or a team and every time ended up with fights and quarrel and argue, good may, may it be, that is come to a place that we need to bring our horsepower together and it takes brokenness. You learn how to submit to one another and make it works. Life is just like that. Brokenness. In ministry, I look for brokenness. You're not broken, you're not ready to serve. Because if you're not broken and when you are employed to a church serving the senior pastor, the whole life you give the senior pastor a headache. Because you... Do not know what ministry is. You bring the wisdom of the spirit of the world into the spiritual context. Wow. Can you imagine the high calling of God? The price we pay? And then I look for stability. I was a chairman of Teen Challenge for six years, IPC, Institute of Public Character. In these six years, uh, Brother Sam Kuna was my Executive director, some of you know who is Sam Kuna. And one day Sam Kuna came with a big file. Pastor Anthony, I'm so happy. I found a candidate. And uh, we can consider him to be the next ED of Teen Challenge. I said, thank you. And so I read through the file and come to the area of uh, resume. His years of experience, blah, 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 blah. I said, Sam, 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 sit down. Have you read through his resume? Uh, he, he didn't really read through, just browse through. Uh, I said, uh, according to what I saw from the submission, uh, he has been serving in different Christians, uh, blah, 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 for the last 17 years. Mm, very good. Uh, but 17 years in 12 organizations. That means in one organization, he did not even last <laughs> one year or two years. Every short term, he applied for a next organization. You have a good record of so many organizations, but your tenureship is short. Sam, do you think that this candidate, when served in challenge, how long would he last? <laughs> I look for stability. You look for men and women who stay put in one task for long enough, you know that he learned breakthrough. You know, there is something in us that every time we join a new company and when the company politics going on, you resign and jump to the next company. And then you find some dirty thing in the next company, you don't like it, you resign and you jump. At the end of the day, you realize the problem is you, not the company. You never stay put to work through and constrain and rein yourself in to be a good worker in the society. Can you imagine after you work for the next 15 years and you look back, you change 13 companies. Averagely, not even 12 months. It's a bad record. <laughs> When I look at this style of candidate, you're not suitable for 
number one leadership. We need one that is stable and can bring the company or the organization from strength to strength. This is a household of God. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. Men who are broken, men who are stable, and know how to lead the flock God entrusted to us. Hallelujah. Are we learning something? Servanthood leadership. Let's give Jesus a clap offering. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for learning servanthood. Just a simple washing of the feet. Lord, I thank you for new insight and story to carry along. Shall we pray?